We have an exciting talk. Prathop is here to talk about parallelizing skewed H-based regions using <coughs> splittable do funds. All right, today we are going to talk about uh, how do we parallelize the skewed H-based regions using a technique called splittable do fund. So the agenda looks like this. So we briefly talk about H-base and big table overview, the H-base snapshot storage structure, how do we import these snapshots, a pipeline that we write to import the snapshots, and what are the challenges that we faced in the initial version, and then how did we overcome so that in the next versions we have presented a better solution. So most of you might already be knowing what HBase is, right? It's an open source, distributed, scalable big data store. I'll not be going in detail about HBase and big, big table because this talk is not about that, right? But at, at a high level, we'll cover what is the problem statement that we are trying to solve. So HBase, uh, it is an open source, distributed, scalable data store. And you do have a lot of these data stores in the outside world, but each of them is intended for certain access patterns, right? So this one is primarily used for random read and write access patterns, especially if you have a keys, you can scale up to thousands and millions of QPS, depending on how, how big your, the cluster is. And then it also gives you the automatic sharding of the data across these regions. We'll talk about what exactly region is. And also the server-side processing using coprocess. I just highlighted only a few features, uh, especially given if you have a huge computation and if you would like to do it on the server side, you can just use a coprocess and you can push it. Now, what is on the other side of the big table side? So you know that HBase itself is inspired from the Google Cloud Big Table, right? So a lot of features that are available in HBase is also available in Big Table. But besides that, it also comes up with it's fully managed by Google, and it also gives you the features of high availability, automatic replication within the, across the zones as well as across the regions. It also has the features of auto scaling based on application traffic. And besides that, you get all this enterprise grade security and access control features. Now you can see a lot of functionalities that are available on HBase is available on Big Table, but besides that, you also get a lot of these things free of cost. Right? When I say free of cost, it's managed by someone else, right? So with these advantages, naturally the customers when they're coming from either on-prem or from some other cloud provider, and if they already have HBase workloads, the natural choice that they tend to do is the Big Table. So that is where the uh, things comes up, right? I have a HBase workload and I'm moving to Google Cloud. Probably I want to get rid of all this maintenance of these clusters and all these things, and I'll take advantage of all these beautiful features available on the big table side. Now that brings us to the pattern of migration, right? So we have the data, right, located in HBase, and somehow I would like to move that data onto the big table side, and also then I want to redirect my apps to access the big table. So that is the problem that we are trying to solve, right? To load the data from HBase to the big table. Now, one of the ways that is uh, we generally do loading of the data from HBase to big table is using a feature called snapshots. So in most of the cases, right, in, in general, the snapshots represents a point of a, 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 any data at a point in time, right? In this case, it's a table at a point in time. And most of the snapshots work on a feature called copy on write. So when we say copy on write, as you can see, if I have four blocks, only the modified blocks will go into the snapshot, while the rest of the block is still being linked to the original file. That means your snapshots are very small in size as well, compared to the, right? It's not like every time you take a snapshot, the entire copy is being maintained. It's just the link. And given that uh, in HBase, when you create the snapshots and when you export it to the external storage, all these things happens at the file system level. So that's why there is a minimal impact on the region servers as well. So it, the region servers can continue both uh, in terms of the for read patterns as well as for the write patterns. So that uh, el eliminates the need you know, in terms of the load that it might impact on the region servers. Now, HBase itself comes with a couple of utilities, right? Um, as you can see, the way how you can create the snapshots as well as also allows you to export that snapshot to Google Cloud Storage. So we can use those utilities and then you can create a snapshot and then you can export to the Google Cloud Storage. Great, now you have the snapshot available. Now we want to understand how the storage structure of a particular snapshot looks like, right? So at the top level, you can see there is a table, which is a logical representation of your data. And each table itself is subdivided into multiple regions. Now I said that in the previous slide, we will talk about what exactly region is, right? So if you take any HBase table, right? You have a series of row keys. That's the, you know, the factor that helps you to identify each record in the table. So these row keys are starts from a particular point, a key. 
start key and then there is an end key. So each region represents a subset of those keys, right? So you have a start key, end key, and then either you can do a pre-splitting on the HP saying that, okay, imagine if you have an alphabets, right? A to Z, I want A as one, uh, A to A, C something as one region, and then you, the subsequently uh, other regions as well. Or it can automatically shard as well, right? So there's a parameter which, uh, indicates that to HBase, okay, once my region reaches to a certain point in size, then probably you need to do the splitting of the uh, data. So that's what the region is. And if you also know, there is a, if you know the schema of the HBase tables, or even for big table, right, you generally represent in the terms of column families. So each column family is primarily intended to relate the co-located columns together that you want to either read or write so that they can go together. A lot of times people don't understand why it is because the reason for that is the entire column family gets stored in a store, right? So the third part is that that's where if you have five, imagine that you want to represent a profile of a customer. So first name, last name, address, everything, you want to get that under a single column family called profile so that since everything is stored in that part, it is quite easy to read and write. So that's what the store uh, represents, which is per column family within a region. And now you also have further if you classify that, the actual data is stored in the store files, right? So these store files are also called as H files, and each store file has, again, a series of blocks associated with it. So this is how the layout of the snapshot storage structure looks like. Great, so our first version of our pipeline is we have built a snapshot config. Basically, it tells that, oh, this is where the source data is located on Google Cloud Storage, just like in the previous slides where we exported the data. And then this is my target big table I want to write the data to. And that's what basically snapshot config represents. So once snapshot config is located, and then you can go and read that snapshot, I mean in the second step, restore it to a temporary directory so that you won't touch the original snapshot while you're doing processing this pipeline. And then you'll read from that snapshot using Hadoop format IO, and then you'll convert that into mutations, the way the target data that you want to have for a big table, and then write to the big table. On the left side, just you wait for the things to complete so that you can clean up that restored snapshots. So this is good. So it worked for majority of the use cases, but then we also have figured out some challenges associated with it. So what were the challenges? The first challenge we figured out is the skewed regions. As I said, like some of the regions, uh, if we don't, a lot of times when you don't do the careful pre-splitting of your data in HBase, there is a chance that in any large distributed data system, right, there is a chance that some portions of data is highly skewed compared to other regions. Now that will introduce a problem of, okay, if you're reading each region, uh, if your region is the parallelism, right, that means there is a chance that there are certain stragglers are going to be impacted. So that's what we notice that, okay, if uh, there is a parameter, as I said, HBase region max file size, which is generally set to 10 gigabytes, but there are customers who are maintaining terabytes of data, they'll increase that to a, a little bit larger size, like either 100 gigabytes or half a terabyte. Now, in such cases, if you identify that these regions compared to other regions, uh, there are certain regions which are highly skewed, that means when you launch a data flow job, rest of the regions got finished, but in one or two regions are taking a lot of time because the, our parallelism is at each region level, right? So this has introduced, okay, how do I deal with skewed regions so that you know, I can further split the region by certain decision making so that I can further parallelize my pipeline. So that is a challenge that we need to solve. The second thing is the initial version of our pipeline when we launched, it is a single table snapshot. What I mean is, so the pipeline works only for the one table, right? If I have 10 tables, I need to launch 10 instances of that pipeline, right? It, it doesn't take the multiple ta tables into as a config, it's just one table snapshot uh, at a time. So we try to address both these problems in the second version. So this is how the second version uh, looks like. So you'll read the multiple snapshot configs, as I said, so that you can go ahead and launch n number of tables. You list the regions, and you try to further split this region if a region's threshold is above a certain size so that you can further parallelize these reads. And then obviously you'll create the mutations and you write it to the multiple tables in big table. So the, if you see, except the, first step, which we modified to read multiple snapshot configs, the fourth and fifth is still same, right? right? Create mutation, but now, of course, you're writing to multiple tables. The crux of the things is between the, you know, listing the regions and reading the region splits. So how did we achieve that? Because that is the kind of thing that we helps us to further parallelize the pipeline. 
So that's where the this new concept comes in, right? Splittable do fun. So Beam had this source API for a long time. So it is used to build your I/O connectors. Both uh, it has a separate for bounded. It has a separate API for unbounded. So, but the Beam community has been working for a long time how to improve this source API so that they can take advantage of uh, you know uh, further optimizations. At that point of time, they figured out okay, there is some new concept that has been evolved. One of them is spreadable do fun. So the advantage of the spreadable do fun is it provides a very powerful abstraction with support to split each element of work. We'll talk about what exactly is element, right? Imagine that, let's take a concrete example. So you want to load, you have a directory, and you want to give, say, I want to load all the CSV files in a particular directory. So first step is you'll give a directory path as an input, and then you go and do a glob search on a particular storage system. You get a p collection of files that are matching using fileio.match. And then the next step is where you know, you'll go and start reading each file. Now here, the element is nothing but each file, right? Imagine you had 1,000 files. A few files are very huge in size, whereas the rest of the files are very small. That means, again, you have this stragglers, right? In a normal do fun, that is the issue, right? Because each element here, that is the lowest element that you can, that is the lowest level that you can parallelize inside a do fun. That is where the splittable do fun comes into one of the pictures that, okay, you can further split that work so that you know this one element doesn't hold out the things. In this case, we, we are talking about one element is nothing but a file, right? How can you further split it? Imagine you have a file of 1,000 bytes. You can further split it to 250 bytes, 400 bytes, 200 bytes, some, some kind of thing, right? Using offset, offset range. So splittable do fun gives you that power in order to do that work. It can be even, for example, a Kafka topic, or it can be even a database table, right? You can do any of these things. Element can be any, any of these uh, things. So it, it gives you the chance of doing that dynamic rebalancing to avoid the stragglers. So you might also be hearing a word called liquid sharding, and it is the same thing. So we'll talk a little bit at a high level, the API of splittable Dufan. When we say restriction, Restriction represents the total amount of work that you need to do, right? For example, if you take a file, the total amount of work that you need to do is to read from the start byte all the way to the end byte, right? So that is what the restriction says. In, the <coughs> in this case, for file, it can be offset range. In our, in our case, in case of uh, table, HBase table, it can be a byte key range, right? You have the start byte key and all, way, all the way to the end byte key. It has a very similar syntax as Dufan. Um, because that will help you not to learn altogether a new thing, but just adds another parameter called restriction tracker. So restriction tracker is the one that keeps track of which portion of work that you're dealing with, right? So when you split the work again into multiple portions, restriction tracks, uh, tracker keeps track of, okay, this is the portion of work that I'm dealing with, and I want to make sure that if I further need to parallelize, I need to further split it, right? So the restriction tracker keeps track of that. Get initial restriction is where you first define what is my initial restriction, right? In, the, in case of file, for example, you will say, hey, this is my start byte and this is my end byte. So that is what the initial restriction will tell. Split restriction is where you try to split that into multiple chunks. So for example, if you know that, hey, my file is like, you know, 100 megabytes, I would like to split into 10 megabytes each. You will say in split restriction, hey, can you divide this 100 megabytes of my initial restriction into further, you know, 10 splits or 15 splits? So this is how it looks like, right? When you start with um, things, you'll pair each element with an initial restriction, right? As I said, you'll start with a file, uh, or if you'll talk about in our context, it's a region. So where you say that, hey, this is my total amount of work. And then you'll pass it to the next step called split restriction, where you say that, OK, can I divide this in, into a multiple chunks on certain parameters, right? Now you got this parallelism. Uh, you, you further split that initial restriction into a few, few splits. And then now all each of these things, like KV, AR1 to ARN, will start working in parallel, right? Now you're no longer bound to a specific element. You're further splitting that element into multiple chunks. And then Dataflow also gives you further advantage that if, if Dataflow decides that even within that split, it is larger in size, it will try to further split it as well, which is called dynamic splitting or liquid sharding. So in that way, now you're getting a lot of parallelism, and you're not bound to a single element level parallelism. Let's talk about how is this applicable in our context, right? 
So you know that in our context, the region earlier when we were discussing, region is the lowest element of parallelism that we talked about in version one. Each region represents a start key and an end key. Now that is what our initial restriction for splittable dofun is, right? You have a start key and end key for this region. So we'll start from there as an initial restriction, and then we'll decide, okay, how do we, the, as I said, the next step is split restriction, right? So what we are trying to do here is, we are trying to calculate the region size. If the size of the region is above certain threshold, for example, say I say that if it is above gigab, example, I'll say, okay, let me go and divide them into a chunks of one megabyte or 10 megabytes kind of thing. So you can calculate, hey, I want if the reach each region is greater than this size, can you divide that into X number of splits, right? And then we pass that, um, HBase itself will comes with certain algorithms like uniform splitting, hex string split and decimal string split. So we have used uniform splitting algorithm where you say that, hey, can you take this region which is of certain size and can you give me 10 splits out of that, right? So once you give that, this is what I'm telling, hey, this is my start and end, and can you give me X number of splits, right? So that uniform splitting algorithm will try to divide this entire region into X number of splits. And then that is passed to the next one. So when you pass that into the next one, into the process element step, <coughs> now what you do is, now <coughs> this restriction tracker is keeping track of that split, right? Not the entire region now, it's just one split. Now, in our example, as I said, if there are 10 splits, there are 10 instances of this is being run in parallel. Now, that particular, we are just reading that split, and then we are uh, trying to read each record associated with that split. So this has helped us to go ahead and further solve it at the, our parallelism, besides the region, right? In the previous case, it's at the region level, now it is at a subset of that, right, which is a split. Great. So for majority of the things, it's good. As I said, the data flow also comes with, you know, where once you feed a particular split into the do fun, it itself can, for example, the runner itself can decide, oh, maybe this split is even larger compared to other splits, I can still further, you know, divide this split, right? You don't need to work on it. It says, I'll try to further split this into the current portion and I can take some amount of work out of it and I can, which is called residual portion and can give it to something else, right? So that is what is called as dynamic splitting, right? So it, it takes that small w unit of work, which we can say restriction, and then it will further try to get into primary and residual parts. And these runners will schedule that residual part into another instance so that you can further parallelize it. So this is how it looks like. What we noticed is, as I said, with our initial splits, it was working fine. And when we try to give that capability of where it tries to further split that split, in a lot of cases, we haven't seen great improvement because we have already split that into a very smaller chunks, maybe 1 MB or 10 MB or 15 MB, right? We don't want that to be further split because we have already taken that uh, decision in the initial restriction method only, right? So we thought that, okay, the total region size is X, and I want to have my one split as somewhere around 10 megabytes. I've already decided how many splits I want, right? But, and we don't want the uh, further splitting. It is okay to leave it, but what we notice in our example is, sometimes when Dataflow tries to further split that, it is aggressively scaling the number of workers. So for some reason, you know, the runner is aggressively scaling the number of workers, but the value that you get further splitting it is very less, right? So we decided that maybe you know we want to control that using a parameter, right? It, to allow either you further want to split it or just you tell the data flow, hey, I've already taken care of my splits. You don't need to do the hard part, right? So that is where uh, we have written this uh, tracker, right? HBase region split tracker, which extends the restrict, you know, restriction tracker, and it takes a parameter called, hey, do I need to enable dynamic splitting or not, right? So the way the data flow runner further tries to split is, it'll call this method called try split, and it gives you, hey, how much amount of work I'm still pending, right? Now here we are telling, hey, if, if the user has opted for the enable dynamic splitting, then you try to split it. Otherwise, you just say don't split it, right? So that is why uh, we have given that power as an option to the user, whether they really need to further split it or just they are saying, if you have already taken our decision, you don't need to worry. I mean, like data flow, need, don't need to worry about that. So this is how the pipeline looks like. Um, so you read the snapshot configs, the same steps that we have discussed, 
and it goes to the restore snapshots. You're listing the regions. And the bulk of the work is done on the read regions, right, where you have the spreadable DoFun and everything covered up. And then finally, you'll, in the same step, you'll convert it to mutations as well, and we'll write to big table. The left-hand side, again, it's a regular thing, which you'll try to clean up the restored snapshots. And none of the experiments are complete without writing the test, right? We want to make sure that how effective we have solved this problem. We have taken a couple of data sets of different sizes. One of them is 104 gigabytes, which has 19 regions. And you can see these regions are varying in different sizes. One of them is 3.5, six regions of 3.5 gigabytes, and the remaining 13 regions are approximately seven gigabytes. And we have also taken another data set of 875 gigabytes, and again, it has 14 regions, and their region size varies anywhere from 30 to 100 gigabytes. So overall, our test has shown that and we, anywhere between 10 to 30 percent improvements in overall run duration, and also significant reduction in the vCPRs, which helps you to save your cost as well. As I said, we tried by controlling that uh, you know dynamic splitting, both enabling and disabling. But at least our test for a couple of these data sets has shown that enabling the further dynamic splitting didn't give much result. As the side effect of that we have seen is the scaling of the workers has gone up a lot when auto scaling is enabled. So for most of the R tests, we disable that part. But maybe for certain uh, data sets, it might work. So it is still available as an option. All right, so that takes us to the end of the talk. Any questions?